The following is a presentation of the University of St. Thomas with campuses in Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota. Hello everyone, welcome to today's St. Thomas webinar. My name is Jacob Sevening and I'm here with marketing professor Gino Giovanelli. Gino, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. Well, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, you want to take a minute to introduce yourself to uh, everyone out there listening? Sure. Um, hi folks, happy Friday. Um, my name is Gino Giovanelli and I am a professor here at St. Thomas. Uh, I teach uh, all the digital marketing courses that we offer uh, at the undergraduate MBA and executive education uh, programs. Um, I've been here for, I don't know, five years or so. I've taught some adjunct and now I'm, uh, I'm full time. And in addition to teaching here, I also have my own consulting business called Miles Interactive. Uh, and that company is really all about helping companies figure out really what they should do versus what they could do online. Uh, there seems to be so many opportunities in the digital space that companies probably have more. I, I I'd argue they almost have more of a challenge trying to figure out what they should do than actually implementing the things they decide to do. Uh, but uh, so uh, and then a lot of that time it usually leads to a new website development project where I kind of stay on and, and become a project manager and stay with those clients. So most of my clients I've had for five plus years because website projects are never done. Uh, so that's, that's how I spend my days. All right. Um, yeah. And we're just talking about uh, your experience today with Super Bowl 52, where you were the uh, digital marketing lead. You want to talk a little bit exactly what your job was and, yes. and how you got there? Sure. Um, it started, the story of the Super Bowl started actually with Sun Country Airlines. I was called in uh, to help them develop their digital marketing strategy, and then, which typically leads to a new website. And one of the people that I had the pleasure of working with um, asked me to do that job. And then when she came over and did the uh, Super Bowl, or was assigned to become the sales uh, and marketing VP at the Super Bowl, her name is Wendy Blackshaw, uh, she asked me to come on and do a similar role uh, for the Super Bowl host committee. And so it's, it's, uh, it's one of those situations where then, it was about three years ago, Jacob, where uh, she asked me to come in and sort of help uh, more or less develop the strategy and figure out the game plan of, of how we could use these different digital channels, uh, you know, search, social, website. Uh, and so um, I worked with her on that and my role over the last three years has, has changed dramatically. Uh, but it started out to sort of uh, help us figure out how to make best use of the digital marketing channels for the Super Bowl. Okay. Um, and really, I just kind of want to know on a personal level, I mean, did you know what you were getting yourself into when with you signed that, up for this? Not a bit. I, I, what I knew is I loved working with Wendy. Mm -hmm. And obviously the Super Bowl is a, is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, when I first started working with her, we, the Super Bowl host committee was really three people. It was Maureen Bausch, who's the CEO, Wendy Blackshaw, who's the I guess, senior VP of sales and marketing. They had an admin. And then I, I would come in and, and sort of work with them on trying to get the website. But we had to build a website really early on because Wendy was going out and uh, looking for partnership opportunities. And we needed to show them that there was some sort of epicenter of where they would get exposure as a partner mm -hmm. two years before the event. So how does that develop and grow then, you know, from two to three years out to, you know, the, I mean, leading right up to the right day of maybe not so much, you know, the days and months leading up to the Super Bowl, but right. maybe the, the two years before, how does that team develop from three people into it grows to, to, I think we had the, we had the big celebration party last night. It was about 40, I think there were 40 people on the host committee and plus 10 interns. So over the course of, of two plus years, there's constantly new people coming in. Um, which, so like, it creates all kinds of, where you're kind of, you're constantly kind of going back and saying, here's what we've done already before you got here. And then what do you, what are the things you want added now that you're here, which is tricky. Cause if you do that, I always think about websites, like you're building a house. We built a house for people before they even showed up at the house. And, um, and also the target audiences for the house changed over time. In the beginning, the target audience were our partners. Uh, and, and that was like kind of like two years ago or so. And then it flipped to 
the focus or the target audience or the website with a volunteer. We need to sign up 10,000 volunteers. So now the target audience shifts from partners to volunteers. Then when you get into the 2017 season, then it becomes a site for football fans. And then two weeks before the site, or it becomes, now you know it's the Eagles and the Patriots. So, so that's like four target audience because you're trying to get those fans to get really fired up and come here, stay in our hotels, come to our restaurants, go to our attraction. So you're building a house for four different sets of families with different needs, but we had to build the bones of the house before we, you know, for all that had to work for all of those different groups. And being, you know, local to Minnesota, yeah. I mean, with the Vikings and the season they had, you know, right up until the last couple yes. weeks there. I mean, what was that planning like, if you think, you know, we have a hometown. Yeah, that uh, was really bizarre. Um, <laughs> got, my, my heart hurt, obviously, when the Vikings didn't get in, but I think logistically speaking, it, it would have introduced other challenges. Um, so it was bittersweet. Uh, I think, it, yeah, I, I mean, to only know two weeks out if your hometown team is in. Uh, you know, like for example, we were thinking about the, the, the 10 days leading up to the Super Bowl. Uh, we had concerts every night. The good news is we didn't have to sell tickets because it was an outdoor concert. But then if the Vikings got in, the number of people that would flood would be a lot more than if the Vikings weren't in. So I think we were projecting, I don't know, maybe uh, 100,000 people downtown if the Vikings didn't get in. But if they did get in, 500,000. So now, because we didn't sell tickets, we can't restrict the number of people. You know, up until that point, we're hoping we can get enough people downtown. Then we're like, oh my gosh, if all these people from Minnesota come because the Vikings are in, now we have a, a challenge of like, how do you control? So the point we almost thought about creating sort of an online um, lottery. But you'd have to build that whole thing in two weeks. And it was like, oh, so when the Vikings lost, we're like, now we don't for sure don't have to worry about that. Uh, so, so so, so, you know, in your mind, it's less comp complicated, but your heart still hurts because you, we were all grieving the fact that the Vikings didn't get in. So it's, I guess it's bittersweet going back to my point. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm. So, I mean, you already addressed some of the, you yeah. know, on the fly issues of this right. project, but what were some of the biggest challenges? I think for sure that notion of a shifting target audience. I mean, the site that we built two and a half years ago had to accommodate football fans, volunteers, Patriots fans, Packers, you know, whoever. Uh, that changing was was challenging because again, the, the bones of the site were already built. We couldn't go back and rebuild a new site every time we had a new target audience that we needed to line up with. So you had to have a lot of forward thinking into making sure it's gonna work through the evolution. Rarely do I have a client, like other, like Sun Country's website, is for vacation travelers, right? Um, Caribou Coffee's website is you know, for people who want to buy. So I never had to worry before about this dramatically changing target audience. The other part was the shift in my role from being sort of a strategic um, planner in the beginning, mapping out all these releases, what they were gonna include and not include, and project managing the build of a site. To the end of the project, Jacob, I was updating, you know, the zip lines running late because of high winds. Uh, I'd be the one updating that content or um, all the concert, the building out all the content of the pages. My role shifted to be, you know, more hands and feet. In the beginning, it, it was it was more thinking and planning to action and doing. Mm -hmm. And and that that was a, a, a challenge is that it, what I learned is to be flexible and to be you know, I remember they're, they're asking me, hey, you know, can we run some video ads on YouTube? And I'm like, you know, I've never done that, but uh, I'll, I'll figure it out. I'm like, when do you want to buy? Uh, tomorrow. Okay, I guess I'll figure it out by tomorrow. You know, so it, it forced me to play in, in hands and feet type areas that I don't normally play in, which is great for a strategist to have an appreciation for what it takes to, to keep that site alive and, and running. And uh, so I got involved in paid search and, and just, it, I loved it, but it was also like anything they needed anything they needed done and, and you just do it. So I guess in 
I mean, what was your experience like then before with other clients where you hadn't done right. so much of right. this interactive right. uh, kind of media? Yeah, the, uh, with, other, with other clients, I, 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 I kind of consider myself a digital marketing strategist. Um, and for a couple clients, I get in and, and do the, the, the tactical stuff, but never one to this degree. I mean, we had, we had you know, 52 weeks of every week we were awarding um, legacy money to, you know, to schools and we're recognizing famous Minnesotans and we're recognizing uh, top restaurants and, and all that content had to be done. And there's contrary to popular belief, there's not a lot of people to do that work. So I probably got more hands-on work on this thing than, than I ever expected and that I've ever done. But I've, I, on this side of it, so glad that I've done that because I, I have a full appreciation for all the moving parts. Because a lot of times we think about websites and like, a, you know, you're delivering a child and the child is handed over to the parents and then they take it and run with it. I felt like with this one, there were no parents to hand it off to. It was just us. <laughs> and so the care and feeding is, was, was, uh, was important and more so than I've ever done. Um, and I, you kind of address this a little bit, yeah. but you know, what surprised you the most? What was most unexpected? Um, I think I thought this, this entity called the NFL, I wasn't sure kind of, are they a stakeholder? Are they our bot or who? Um, and just not knowing what things need to be approved. I mean, we, we had, we sort of had the playbook, but you're still, I equate it to planning a wedding. Most times you, or hopefully you're doing it once, but when you're doing it once, you've never, hopefully never had to do it before. So there's a lot of inefficiencies. <laughs> um, and, and I guess it was more efficient than I thought. I didn't know that, again how many things had needed to be approved by so many different people, and it went it went reasonably smoothly. And I I wish you know now that I know what I know, you know helping out Atlanta or Miami or Tampa or whatever the next, I mean it would it would make sense to try to leverage that. But at the same time, I mean that's part of the the cool thing about the Super Bowl is that you you hire local people to do it. So if you're hiring local people to do everything that we did. What's the chance any of us have ever done this before? So it kind of goes with the turf. Um, but again, I'm surprised at how smooth everything went. Did you reach out to any past and, most committees? Or anecdotally, uh, when, Wendy Blackshaw, you know, it was, and there was a lot of people that were literally uh, employees of the host committee. They, it's, it's a really cool sort of uh, family where um, I remember they all went down to Houston during the Super Bowl last year. I'm like, the last thing Houston needs is a bunch of people for, that are a year out tagging along with everything they're doing when they're under the heat and light of the Super Bowl. Um, and we, we did it too for the next city. Uh, so there is a good sense of uh, fraternity between the cities, but at the same time, the cities don't traditionally hire that same crew. And then the fact that there's only a couple of people, I think on our host committee that have ever, that ever did one. The rest of that, that means the rest of us had an opportunity to work on something we've never worked on. The good news is you're working on something you've never worked on. The bad news is you're working on something you've never worked on. So it, it, it creates, um, you know, a big, a huge learning moment. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, faced with the opportunity to maybe do this again, I'm not sure. I kind of love the way this went. It's almost like people are like, you know, what's the next, where are you, you going to do this again? I'm like, I, maybe this is a one and done. I don't even know if they'd be interested, but I know I didn't personally call up the person who had my role in the last one or any of them. I did hear from via Wendy, some of their key learnings and things like that, but not as much as you might think. Okay. Yeah. Um, and in the midst of this, you're teaching classes <laughs> as a professor here. I mean, you were yeah. just right before this webinar, you were teaching in class yes. and literally Yep. ran down the hall to get here for this. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I came in winded. I'm like, so out of shape. Okay, that was that was crazy. Uh, fortunately, I didn't teach in January. Okay. And, you know, someone from the host committee has even said, like, I think we're going to need to see you at the office more. I'm like, fine. I, I'm not teaching in January. So I basically was there a, a ton. 
But, you know, December was really hard with finals week um, and just, you know, the normal end of the semester kind of work where uh, I was literally at the Super Bowl office as much as I possibly could. But there were times where it was really challenging. The funny thing you get a kick out of this is that the first day of spring semester, <laughs> I had two classes that met on the uh, first day of class was the Tuesday before the Super Bowl. And I remember walking in, normally the first day of class, you're introducing and you're talking about the course and all the expectations. As I'm walking into class, I get this kind of urgent email that says, we need to update the zip line page because the, the shifts are running late because of the winds or something like that. So literally the first day of class, I said, guys, my name is Gino and I'm gonna pause right now. <laughs> and I said, I looked at my phone and I'm like, okay, does somebody wanna come up here and actually, I have to make an update to the Super Bowl site. And I'll tell you why I need to make an update, but I just need to make it right now. So who wants to actually do that change? And then you can tell an employer in a job interview that you actually updated the Super Bowl website. And I said, and the person came up and I'm like, okay, now I need you to do exactly what I tell you to do and not anything I don't tell you to do. Because when you change it, you know, this is not traditional marketing where we have approvals and signatures and running files around. When we make that change and you hit save, and you hit F5 and you reload your page, that content changes live. And so I had a student literally do that. And then the next day I had to do it again for something else. But they got, the point is the students got exposure to what it, what it means to work in, in web speed. And the other thing I said is now when we're done making the change, I said, now you get to do my favorite part of my job is write back to that person and say the word done, D-O-N-E, send. And that's, that's how quickly we work. So students had a chance to kind of live in that a little bit and all fall semester every class started with a you want to know what's going on with the super bowl and of course, you know it's like it's something very tangible and so that became you know the, even the super bowl live which was that 10 days of concerts um i had just before class had come from a sort of a ideation uh meeting where we literally on a big piece of flip chart paper drew it out and i brought that to class and we were working, we were learning that day about the need to wireframe a website. And I said, this, this is a wireframe we built literally today. And I said, the site, this page is gonna be built in like two days and you'll be able to see, because I had them all come up and I, went, I talked to the whole sketch and you, they can see that it, it's not professional. It's just, it's real and it's raw. And I, I said, this is gonna become a real site in three days or whatever it was. I said, because it has to, become a website and they were able to see the iterations and know that's the way it goes. So does this change your approach to teaching? I mean, you've always been pretty close to the professional world as right. an adjunct professor right. for a long time. So it's not like you've been removed from the day-to-day the -day -day work of, of things, yeah. but does this project in particular give you a different eye, a uh, different type of experience that sure. you would want to relate to your students? You know, I've always, I've always taught this way. I don't have a textbook. Um, I had an optional textbook my first year because I kind of felt guilty about like, like if, I, if I don't have a textbook, everything you're hearing is only from me. I want you to have a balanced view. And, I, and I, the feed, the, one piece of feedback I got from all the students was like, don't, we don't need the textbook. You know, this real life stuff that if you're willing to, to share with us what's working and what's not working. And, and I say, you know, we, 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 we fail fast, we win big. And we don't, we don't hide when we don't do I mean, there's certain things we're gonna try that aren't gonna work, I, I teach that way. And so every class I've, I've really ever taught has all been about real things that happen to real companies. This one, the, the big change is, is how much needed to change while I was teaching the course. Uh, the other examples of real sites, you know, like the Caribou Coffee website or the Sun Country, those are sites that the majority of the work happened in the past and I speak about the past. And here's what we did. Here's why the homepage looks like this, blah, blah, blah. This one wasn't past tense. This one was present tense. So if anything, this taught me the value of being able to say, I know this looked different last week. Here are the changes we made this week. And they're able to be part of that, that journey was, I, th I hope, even more valuable. Okay. Um, and what was it uh, like during those final weeks 
leading up to the Super Bowl. I mean, did you sleep at all? Yeah, I did. Not the, the folks I worked with, I'm not sure if they did. I mean, I, I remember, this is funny, Martin Luther King, I, I don't know if any of these guys are listening from the host committee, but I remember asking um, this woman, uh, Tierney, who I worked with, and I said, Tierney, are we working on Martin Luther King Day? And she looked at me, and she's like, um, we've been working seven day work weeks since mid December. I'm not, you know, I, I'm pretty sure we're, <laughs> I was like, oh gosh. Um, so the point is it, it was more wild for others than for me. Uh, I was, you know, some, some degree more of a utility guy. I would jump in when needed, especially um, in those last couple of weeks. It got, it got really wild leading up to Super Bowl live, which is the 10 day. Then that's, that's kind of our big thing. I mean, the game is belongs to the NFL and, but the 10 days leading up to it, Super Bowl Live, that's our deal. We, that's, so, so the chaos was really leading up to Super Bowl Live. But once that started running, it died down because of all that planning. So I thought it was going to go crazy up until the game. And it really went crazy up until 10 days before the game. And then it died down. Then I was able to go out and actually experience it. And it's funny because I'd go to the office and no one would be there. I'm like, where is it right? He's like, we have like 31 events going on today. We're all at those events, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh! So, so really, we were we were we were done with the marketing, for the most part, other than the recaps of what happened every day. But it was the whole calendar shifted ten days forward. So really, the busiest time was leading up to like that third week of January. And that last week was was fairly enjoyable. So then, what was that like when you actually get to go experience the events that you've been working on? Yeah, it's it's a it's a proud moment when you when you're seeing the concerts from the artists and you you built the concert page for it and you know you're putting the names of these bands in and I I've never felt so dang old as I felt on this project. I remember, for example, there was this one Saturday where um, when we originally sketched out that Super Bowl Live page, I had these little band cards and we had four bands listed because we thought they'd only be. All of a sudden I get a list of like seven bands, but I can only put four on the card. And I picked the four that I thought were the most popular. And then again, I got a call, I think it was from Tierney. And she's like, oh my gosh, you left off the you know, ex ambassadors. I'm like, yeah, I never heard of them. I, you know, I got Bob Mould, I got um, the Jayhawks, I got Soul Asylum. And she's like, oh, that's like the biggest band of the night. And I'm like, hashtag feeling old. You know, it's like, um, <laughs> but it was great to go see those bands and having worked on literally building out pages for them and just you know what what are these ice sculptures like and what's the zip line thing i mean those were those were events but they didn't have um they didn't come to life until i saw them same thing with the eagles and the patriots it's like you're planning the wedding but you don't know who the bride and the groom are until like two weeks before the wedding and now now you know it's them and although you're bummed out that it's that's you know, it's not the vikings but you can still put a personal it becomes real, it becomes personal when you know the teams. Otherwise you're planning a big wedding for an unknown bride and groom. <laughs> kind of weird. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very weird. Um, and well, you also, uh, we also had some other St. Thomas alums who managed the social media yep. for uh, the Super Bowl and you helped out a little bit with that. What was that experience like working with them? Yes, first and foremost, uh, the company, um, started by Emily Pritchard and Martha McCarthy. Mm -hmm. We're alumni of St. Thomas. They're in the entrepreneurship school. And, I, and I, the, the, the legend is, the urban legend is that they came up with this business concept in one of their entrepreneurship courses called, and they named it the Socialites. And I think they even may have got some funding. And anyway, they launched this wildly successful company and they came on board uh, for this for the Super Bowl host committee to run the social media command center. Ooh, what does that mean, right? Uh, and they did a really nice job. I mean, they put together the, the platform, they provided training um, for all of us to come in and use the platform, but basic and the whole strategy around it, they did it all right. And um, so I, I volunteered to serve on that or to, to be a volunteer in the social media command center. And they had a bunch of different roles. One was like a shift lead, and one was a. I became a. I was. I did two two shifts, and I was a, like a media specialist, or and I was a rank and file. And what would happen is I would go in and I use this tool that they trained me on, and it would show every conversation that it was associated with different hashtags because I was working on Twitter at the time, and uh, and I would have the choice of of responding to a question, 
or or maybe not if it was off, it was off strategy or it wasn't appropriate tagging what kind of question it was and whether there was a positive a neutral or a negative uh, is it related to the game is it related to Super Bowl live is it related to um, Super Bowl experience so a lot of like classification but then also jumping in and having a dialogue with these people so we had to kind of learn what's the voice of uh, of us now who's us right so you know do you you know, don't do excessive exclamation marks, don't refer to people by their last name, you know, refer to first name, uh, these topics, you know, and then you could, anytime you replied, it would be lifted up to a shift supervisor that would approve it. I mean, it was really, really buttoned down nicely because, and, and a lot of people over a lot of days are jumping in and just helping out. And basically we're trying to make sure that we're answering people's questions and that we're also keeping an eye out for stuff that we might want to be concerned about that we could escalate. There's plenty of escalation points. I mean, it, I was totally impressed. And this is an area that is kind of not my specialty. I jumped in and just said, if you need a ship covered, my week is dramatically kind of quieter during the Super Bowl live week. So it was, it was a lot of fun to be pulled into that. And the, and the whole St. Thomas thing felt real good. It's like a lot of St. Thomas people down there. And again, these two came out of St. Thomas. They hire a lot of our alumni. Super. And how many people are in there at a given time? What's what's that atmosphere like? Yeah, when you're on a shift, you, you have definitely one shift lead. And then you have like two people directly under them that are um, reviewing and publishing any any comments any of us make that are on sort of that that ground level. So maybe the, uh, the content specialist, ground, I can't, I don't, I'm not sure if that's the actual name, but there were, I think there were like four of us. One would have Facebook, one would have Instagram, and two would have Twitter. And so we were kind of the rank and file. Everything would go to those, uh, the, 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 the lieutenants, and then the shift lead would sit on top of that. So maybe, you know, uh, six, six or so folks. And you had these big screens and you could see all the conversation. I mean, it felt like NASA. I mean, you had everything you know, in front of you. You could see what are people talking about, where, what zones in the, in the country are, are all the, the conversations happening. Super impressive. Yeah, yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, is there anything you do differently next time? Um, talk a little bit about what you learned, what was unique. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the stuff you've yeah. kind of hit already, but um, yeah. anything else that comes to mind? But the only thing is, I, you know, I should have reached out to whoever had my role. I, I honestly don't. It's like one of those things where you just get swept up in the, in the moment. I'm like, somebody else has done this. And I never reached out to them. And it, but it wasn't a pride thing. It was just, um, yeah, I, I, and I would love to help the next person and I, I would ha be happy to do it. I just, uh, I honestly, and I've, I have, my students have asked me the same question and I just like, I really don't know why I didn't, um, because I constantly tell my students, I'm like, you gotta, you gotta say no to stuff so that you can say yes and do the, and the things you say yes to, you gotta do them all in. And I, I think I, I let too much clutter maybe get in the way of, it would have been time well spent to just go, tell me five things you wish you had done differently. Uh, and ironically, one of mine is I would ask somebody five things would they have done differently. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else. Would I have done differently? I'm not sure. I, I think it was, it was, it was awesome. It was fun. It was huge. <laughs> I'll always remember it. It's a little bittersweet uh, the day after the big party last night at, uh, to see this group of people. It almost feels like when you graduated college and you say goodbye to everybody in your fraternity or your dorm or whatever, it's like you've, you've gone through so much together that it goes from 300 miles an hour to nothing. I mean, we looked at the site traffic. I think it went from 70,000 people a day to 700 in like three days. I mean, it's just crickets. And you're like, oh my gosh. It's really over. Everybody's talking about where they're going to go next and what jobs they're going to do. We're, they're all out of work in a good way, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, and now that it's done, what has been your fondest memory? You know, you talked about Super Bowl Live. Um, were there any other moments where you were just able to kind of take it all in and appreciate what you've done? You know, yeah, I, it's. It's funny. I, I I listen. I watch CNN every morning. I always have, and that's I don't look at local news at all. For whatever reason, as we got closer to Super Bowl, I started flipping over to local channels, and that's all they talked about was the Super Bowl. 
and to see them share it on the news and just it started to feel real 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 soon uh and if i had continued to watch cnn i just it, it, it might have just blown right by me right because we we spent a lot of time at the host committee office while they were decorating oh you know that probably the other thing jacob was walking through the skyway in january and seeing them put up all the signage and they're building the Birkebriner bridge and then you see them building the stage i'm like oh my gosh this is really coming because really before that again because you don't know the bride and the groom you don't see anything different in the streets no one else is really talking about super bowl you're trying to get your vikings through the playoffs it just it didn't feel like anything it felt like a big project happening in another country and all of a sudden it became holy cow this is a huge project happening right here and then the pride of the fact that this whole old north thing resonated so well with people and i'm really proud of, of what minnesota showed we, we took on a huge challenge of having a Super Bowl in an urban location, never done before. And with it urban, you can't exactly gate off Nicollet Mall. I mean, it's a, it's a street. It's, it, it's in the heart of the city. And with that came, you know, challenges, but I'm like, awesome. And, I, and then the night I was at the concert and I'm like, it's three degrees and it's cold and it's snowy and the lights look awesome and there's, and there's warmth by being around people. I've never been so happy to be in, in, in an audience that was just jam packed. Because when I left that audience, it was jam packed because I went to go into the sky, but all of a sudden it got cold. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's some warmth with being uh, just piled up with people. I was so proud of our city and I'm glad it got cold. I'm glad it didn't hang out in the slushy 40s or whatever. I mean, we showed them what we got and that we're not, we're not afraid of it. We, we, we embrace it. I thought it felt real genuine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, hmm. And <clears throat> yeah, that kind of wraps up the scheduled questions that I had. I mean, I know, Gino, you wanted to have sort of a free flowing, uh, you know, kind of conversation about your experience. Yeah. Um, we've already had some questions come oh, in yeah, yeah. Um, from viewers. Um, I invite anyone else to use the Q&A function to submit any questions for Gino that you might have. Um, but one of them that came in sure. uh, already was um, speaking of Bold North and mm -hmm. that whole campaign, um, mm -hmm. the stadium, U.S. Bank Stadium, brand new with its kind of Scandinavian design and everything function right. Right. or uh, fit into that Bold North campaign. You know, what was that like? What was some of the thinking and conversations uh, you guys might have had uh, around all that? Yeah, the, the Bold North conversations were definitely uh, before my time. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think from what I understand, it was this notion of establishing maybe another region in the U.S. You've got the East Coast, you've got the West Coast, you've got the Midwest. And now we've got this thing called the Bold North, and we are the capital. I mean, there's no, it's clear that the Twin Cities are the capital of the Bold North. And versus in the Midwest, you, you know, what, what cities come to mind? Chicago. You know, and we're, we're somewhere under there, you know. And um, so I think the thought was this notion that we are unique. Uh, we're worthy of being called our own region. And we're, we're the North Star in that anchor. We're the anchor in the Bold North. And I think that branding was important to help show the NFL um, that there's something special about this place and not just we're a city in the Midwest other than Chicago. Um, and I think it was a lot of the, why we won the bid. It, was, it came down to us in New Orleans. I mean, New Orleans is tough to beat. Um, especially at Dome Stadium, tough to beat. Um, so, um, yeah, I, again, it, it was more before my time, but it was cool to see it come to life and it gave, the Super Bowl gave a chance for it to, to, to be launched. The stadium looked outstanding inside. I was fortunate enough, I got a ticket and I spent the whole third quarter walking around the stadium and just looked at different vantage points of seeing the field, but seeing all the signage, it just looked spectacular. Awesome. Um, and uh, when you're planning for the influx of people um, yes. into Minneapolis, did you take account, take into account uh, social service issues like homeless shelters? Um, do you think that exacerbated any of the social services in the Twin Cities? Whoa. I don't think I can answer this question. I'm really sorry. I, I, there were 40 committees 
or so, and uh, there were, I know there was one on just this topic, and I was not on that committee. Uh, so I really, honestly, Jacob, I can't answer that question. Okay. I'm really sorry, whoever asked it. Um, did the downtown festivities look like uh, the way you had pictured them in your mind leading up to everything? I remember them talking about this Burke Briner Bridge, and I, I could not get my head around it. And they're like, yeah, you know, people would be, uh, you could cross country ski over, over, you know, Nicolette Mall. I was like, uh, but yeah, what? Say that again? You know, and the, and the zip line, I'm like, it, and the funny thing is that we would see renderings. And there's a guy that's going to ride a snowmobile and flip in the air, and I'd see renderings of it. And then again, when I'm watching the local news in the morning, instead of CNN, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's it. So uh, the, only, the only visuals I had were renderings. And um, did it live up to it? Yeah, um, it did. But it was it, to see it for real was was awesome, you know. Yeah, it. it yeah, and the, and the renderings were just sketches, so you, you kind of got to feel for what was coming, but not not nearly when you saw it for real. Did you ever think the construction on Nicolette Mall would oh ever be done? In time? I remember just because I I office here at the Minneapolis campus for St. Thomas. And every day, you know, when I would walk to the host committee, I would see Nicolette Mall and I'm like, these guys are just, they better get this done. And, uh, and you could tell there was definitely, I'm convinced, I, no, not at all. I might get in trouble when I say this, but if it wasn't for the Super Bowl, I'm not sure it would be done. Um, but it was, when it, when it was done, it lived up to its glory. It, it was pretty spectacular, but uh, yeah, I was a little nervous. I'm like, that's one thing we have no control over, right? We, we the host committee control all these other things. We, we don't have any control over that, but it, it, it lived up to the weight. I can't wait till summer when we get out there. Yep. All right, fantastic. Um, another question is, uh, the Super Bowl was in Minneapolis in 1992 and yep. again in 2018. Yep. Uh, will you be wanting to run the digital media <laughs> in 25-ish years if we get it again? If we got it again, Yeah, I think. I mean, part of it was that it was that we I was working on it, and it was here, and, and and the people. But if the if it's not the same people, I I don't know. But I you know, Wendy and I were having a, just a short conversation about Miami and the notion that you know if we wanted to help those guys out, we would have to move. I mean, it was so convenient. I mean, we were <laughs> local people staying locally to put on an event locally that's that's one of the top three sporting events in the world it was so unique um so if i'm still here and it ever comes back here and those same people are a part of it for sure uh if it's here and it's not the same people i i think i think i'd like to try but uh if it's not here i don't i don't know i'd love to help the person but not not in the same capacity that i serve Sort of in a similar vein, um, you know, you've been doing this for a while. You've worked with a lot of different companies mm -hmm. and seen technology and, and marketing and digital communications evolve quite a bit over time. I guess, what is that like adjusting to new technologies and, and new um, methods for communicating with people? I mean, especially when you're talking about the social media oh, yeah. stuff, yeah, yeah. saying that's not an area that you've been involved right. with. You know, right. what is that like just kind of rolling with the punches yep. and learning new things all the time. We, I was, I was just this morning teaching an exec ed course and you know, the students were like, gosh, we'd really love to know how to stay on, on top of all this technology. I'm like, yeah, I would too. That's my biggest challenge. I mean, and when I teach in the fall semester, I've got January to rewrite my course that the same course I'm teaching in January or sorry, in, in the spring semester. Fortunately in the summer, I've got three months to rewrite. But the number one challenge I have as a digital marketing professional and an educator is keeping up on the, the latest and greatest because it keeps changing so stinking fast. Sometimes I wish I was teaching a topic that, that didn't change, but I, I don't think it would be nearly as fun. And now the way that you learn is to be thrown into having to learn, learning how to learn, which is what I do with my students. Every student builds a website. I do not show them how to do it. I purposely do not. I tell them the methodology and the steps to take, but I do not tell them how to do it. I want them to learn how to do it and learn how to learn. And that's hard, but you, I, I believe you have to be thrown into that to some degree 
to actually do it. So the, the fact that I had to get certified in that, uh, that social media platform with the socialites forced me to see something I wouldn't. And then I actually had to use the tool. And I, again, I never felt so old, you know, click on that. I'm like, oh, I'll go old granddad, like the dad. You know, it's like the way I talk to you, know, like my, my parents a bit. And they're talking to me that way. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm like, uh, you know, click on, wait, what are you guys clicking on? I felt like I was three clicks behind everybody. I'm like, I teach this stuff, right? But I, I it's, it, you, but now I walk away going like, yeah, now I, now I should bring this into my course. I would never have known about that if I hadn't been forced to know about that so I'm, I'm appreciative of the opportunities. And the more times I can get my hands wet, it makes me better in the classroom. Awesome. Um, looks like we have time for one or two more okay. questions here. Um, another question that came in is, what is the impact of working on a project that ultimately is thrown away at the end mm. uh, and the company no longer exists? We just had a meeting on Tuesday to determine how many servers to reduce to on the site. And that's when I, that's how I knew that stat. Um, you know, when someone was saying the site dropped, the traffic fell off like a brick and you're like, it's, it's, it's really over. Um, it, it hasn't kind of hit me yet, but I, but at the same time, it was, it was such a success that uh, it, it's okay to be over. Like, I, I don't have that feeling in a project. Like sometimes I've launched a site and I'm like, uh, we'll get it next time or we'll we'll make it better next time. I don't I don't get the feeling like there needs to be a next time. I just feel like we really hit it and we hit it well and that makes it okay to call it done. I feel like if we didn't really for whatever if for whatever reason we didn't put our best foot forward, I, I'm not fighting for another chance to, to to really next time we do this, I really want to do it. I'm like, I don't have any of that feeling. Um, but it is bittersweet though. I even went, I went to the Super Bowl host committee office the day after the Super Bowl and I almost broke my nose because the door was locked. I'm so used to blasting through there. I was like, oh my gosh, there's nobody here. So I just, I literally sat in the hallway on my laptop waiting for someone to come in. It wasn't much later that somebody showed up, but even when they showed up, I started seeing less people. And on Facebook, some of our interns going home and going back to wherever they lived. Um, but that's part of the process. Uh, and other things have already filled that space. So, well, if not the Super Bowl, then what is your next big dream project? Or at the very least, what's up next for you? You know what? So much of my business is is based on relationships. Um, that I I don't kind of target clients or target companies. I just stay tethered to people that I've worked with before. So I'm super excited to see where Wendy goes next uh, and, and all of my clients that constantly move around. And really that's, that pulls me into opportunities. So it's really being tethered to people and where they go that determines where I go. I, I, I make, I told my students yesterday, I'm like in 11 years, I've gotten one lead off my website and I, and I didn't do it. I didn't do the project. I'm like, I don't want projects that come in from, from people that I don't know. I want to do business with people. I do. I'm at the age where I can be really selective. My model won't scale. Like literally if someone came along while I was doing the Super Bowl and said, I have a dream project, I'd say, I can't do it. It's just me and a couple guys. So uh, because of that, um, I, I'm not looking for a huge pipeline of business. I'm more interested in where, where people I've worked with before end up. And if there's an opportunity to help them there, that's the way I love to do business. Okay. And last question. Um, yes. As you analyze the data from the sites, yep. uh, are there any surprises? Um, for example, yeah. what percent of traffic came from Minnesota? Versus yeah. Minnesota? Oh, yeah. It was it was a ton of Midwest, a ton of Minnesota, a ton of, of, of Wisconsin and stuff. You know what amazed me is that it, it broke my heart in the middle of the Vikings game, uh, where Wendy texted me and she said, uh, "It's time to buy keywords." Um, for, for selling tickets uh, in, in, for Eagles fans and Patriots fans. And I was kind of like, no, come on, they can come back. She's like, no, it's, it's over. And so we started uh, putting those campaigns together um, uh, at, the, at that point. And, and, and it was funny because we bought keywords all about tickets and stuff in different regions where 
for those season ticket holders for the Eagles and the Patriots live and how few people search for those keywords. In the course of like a week, it was like under a thousand people searching for state for for tickets for the Super Bowl in the two in the locations of the two teams that were, were that were invited to play. And there were like, trust me, there were tons of teams that didn't. Most teams didn't get invited to play. Um, and I guess it, I, I was always amazed at that. I'm like, why aren't there more people searching for Super Bowl tickets from, you know, Massachusetts, Vermont, Maine, whatever, wherever the Patriots fans go, and the Eagles fans. And it, it dawned on me when I got to the game, how many people wear jerseys from their favorite team? You know, um, you, you know a lot of obviously Packer jerseys, tons of Vikings jerseys. Uh, I'm a Dolphins fan. I saw a Dolphins jersey. I'm like, we are so not anywhere near that Super Bowl. And, and there were people wearing Dolphins. And I never realized how many people go to that game that really don't have an affinity to the teams that are in. Part of it is logistically. It's like if you find out the Eagles got in, and you start looking at airline tickets two weeks before with a four night minimum stay in a hotel and the tickets, I mean, family, I had a family of Patriots fans next to me. There's like three kids and two, two parents. They're probably 20, 20 grand in with airline tickets, Super Bowl ticket. You got to make that decision in a week. Uh, so I'm putting together a hypothesis that's just the Super Bowl is not just for the teams that got in. It's for anybody that's crazy about this crazy game of football. And I saw all those fans at that stadium wearing, you know, Steelers jerseys, Balt Dolphin jerseys, you know, Cowboy jerseys. So that was a, that was amazing. But when you go to the Google Analytics, it all makes sense. It all makes sense. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for everyone who joined us today and uh, hope to see you back for our next webinar. Thank you.